This is Unforgettable Learning, where we talk to L&D visionaries, experts and mavericks about performance, creativity and tech. Subscribe to stay in touch. In this episode, I welcome Sponge's new Chief Creative Learning Officer, Josh Cardoz, and in a flip of roles, he asks me about the influences L&D can take from outside experiences, inspired by my recent trip to South by Southwest. Okay, who are you? Where in the world are you? I was in Austin. I was in Austin, Texas. And what were you doing in Austin? Well, I'd love to tell you a bit more about it. Um, <laughs> I managed to survive. I'm a survivor of South by Southwest. And uh, the reason I went there was because um, partly I'm completely obsessed with everything immersive. And there's a really fantastic track at the South by Festival. Many people of you will know it because it's a film festival. It's famously a music festival and um, comedy festival. They also have a really great interactive track, which is um, a set of m multiple things going on, talks, concurrent, concurrent events, and a huge hall filled with around 36 different immersive projects. Everything from kind of screen-based and, and sort of physical through to virtual and augmented reality. So I've been sort of throwing myself into that world for uh, a, a good few days and really looking at what's been going on kind of outside of the world of digital learning. I, I mean, taking, taking the reputation of South by Southwest uh, aside as being just one of the great places to be for inspiration and imagination, uh, I am certainly of the camp of our industry and in constant need of a refreshing of ideas and inspiration for things we can and ways we challenge ourselves of what's possible and uh, film, music, comedy, interaction, all of those things for me are tremendously exciting as just parallel universes for what inform what we do. So uh, I guess that's a very long winded way of me saying, tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny, I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, the danger of working in any sphere is that we only look to the references and other work of people within our own world, or um, we maybe run into the trap of letting potentially clients or partners or the way things are done around here kind of lead the way we work. So I think it's really healthy and necessary to explore inspiration from all different corners of life and events and everywhere and just figure out whether any of that can be usefully applied. It may not be, but some of it can be. And I've definitely in my time working in learning kind of found so much more inspiration from outside the sphere that we're in. Um, probably all of it, in fact. So yeah, well, let me dive in. <laughs> I'll dive into a few things. I, I mean, I wouldn't say I've kind of summarized everything that's happened there. And I would definitely recommend anybody to visit the, the sort of South by um, YouTube channel because you can catch up on some of the talks that have, that I'll mention in a minute. But yeah, yeah, I'll point you to a few few bits and pieces. But um, I guess the, the the place where I've sort of found myself um, getting excited initially was around one of the sort of perpetual L and D goals, which is kind of better connection with audiences, engagement, if you will. And um, we know that this is really important in our work because we're using it to kind of inform and to coach and to build capability and performance. And <clears throat> I feel like there are so many new ways that people, you know, sort of in marketing terms, audiences are sort of spending their attention and new formats for storytelling and new aesthetics uh, that if we're not careful, we might get left behind. And so a lot of the, a lot of the things that I've seen, I think we can take some inspiration from. And the first thing that I was going to touch on was the what's there've been lots of talks and I've seen a fair few experiences of this sort of ever increasing influence of collaborative open world games like Fortnite and Roblox. <clears throat> and let me give you some stats if we want to think about engagement. Roblox has 72 million daily users. I, I met the girl from Roblox and she was explaining this and uh, two and a half hours per day spent in that platform. Now, the ages are roughly between nine and 24 and around 60% of those are under 16. So it's not a kind of workplace level audience. But then if we think about Fortnite, where the ages are kind of 18 to 24, 60% of users are that in that age bracket, 
generating 85% of Epic's revenue. So F Epic is the company that owns Fortnite, so the gaming platform way more than Unreal Engine is, is kind of generating its revenue and other things that it does. The gender demographics are kind of startling. 90% are male, 10% are female, but roughly the average usage is six to 10 hours a week. Now, I ask you, Josh, think about an LMS platform. <laughs> When we think about kind of content and users and learning, you know, it's about as far away as you could get, you know, and ostensibly we're trying to do the same thing. We're trying to pull people into a platform but often, you know, that's often our point of contact with, with workplace audiences. And, um, I just, I just, I'm finding that they're onto something. <laughs> we know this. Um, what is it that we might be able to borrow from that? And this audience is really highly active. And they're reaching workplace age. They've got really strong experience in cooperation, collaboration, goal attainment, handling setbacks, team dynamics, basically all the stuff that we're, you know, encouraging and fostering in workplaces. And um, I just think that that's, it's just really fertile ground for exploration. Um, yeah, I don't know if you've been seeing that or having discussions around this stuff. Uh, this is so many connections to talk about. I'll, I'll have to temper myself in my excitement around this. I remember listening to a podcast interview with someone who was responsible for, I want to say Roblox university. And that is, and that is, um, taking, uh, everything that is amazing about Roblox and fine tuning it in sort of a K to 12 environment, because we do know that, uh, the majority of users are in that K to 12 environment and, uh, the, at risk of being an old man, shaking his fist at the cloud, everything that I've learned about Roblox, I've learned from my 11 year old niece, who is ridiculously obsessed with it to the point of that six hours or nine hours that you mentioned, she's crushing that gold beyond you can imagine right. to two and a half hours the, a day. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and. I think the exciting, and I'll, I'll get to Fortnite in a second, but I think the exciting thing about Roblox that is instructive, I would say, to what we try and do and accomplish is that aesthetically, there's nothing actually fantastic about Roblox. It's almost like Minecraft, where it, it's got this kind of analog 8-bit vibe to it, where when you think of it, and I am a lover and aficionado when it comes to open world games, there's nothing about it that makes you go, ooh, what a beautiful game, or it's exciting. It's not Super Mario. It's not like your Final Fantasies of the world. It's kind of eh. But the exciting part of it, and I think this is the catch of it, and you totally hit the nail on the head by saying, this is tomorrow's workforce, and this is the world that they've come in, and this is who they are as digital consumers, hence also digital learning consumers to a certain rational conclusion, is that there is so much autonomy in these worlds. There is so much collaboration in this world. There's so much co-ownership in this world of cr literally creating your own world that that is the part where social happens, where you mentioned about new voices and new mediums to engage new voices. This is the reality of any learning professional. And if we think about this is the age that's going to be in the workforce and 10 years time, if not sooner, what does that mean for us? And I'll contrast that to your point, coming from a world of Roblox and Fortnite. And then the first thing you see in your first new job is welcome to this LMS, where it's just like- Welcome you, you, to this e-learning. Ah. Welcome to this e-learning, <laughs> where it's such what? a tight, almost like restrictive, sequential, opposite of open world, restrictions, mandatory, all of these things. And what a great contrast and juxtaposition of expectation of experience. And we talk all the time about employee experience and how we elevate our EVP and all these types of things. When you come from the world of Fortnite and Roblox, where it is truly here is a sandbox and it's the biggest sandbox you've ever seen in your life and create meaning and value and camaraderie in it as well too, to getting to a place where everything is about, I'm gonna tell you what you need. I'm gonna tell you which direction you need to go. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna leave it up to you to think about what makes the most amount of sense for you. And just what a fantastic intersection and an opportunity for us to learn from something like Roblox and Fortnite. I don't, I don't know if 
Yeah, that resonates totally for agree. you. Yeah, it totally resonates. And I've been thinking about, you know, what do we know that works in learning from the learning science and from sort of human behavior? It's high agency, it's high social connection, it's high autonomy, you know, we can master our destiny. And I think, to your point, there's something about these spatialized worlds, where a new kind of feature of it that is, is kind of different from the classical sort of digital learning side is that you have embodiment. You can be the main character. We just have this completely barrier free co-presence for multiplay. And we all, or we, we can also have personalized experiences. And what I mean by that is there's a kind of magic and surprise for each individual. So it's not that we all might end up going through the same story. We might end up with a core story or a core theme, but there's going to be miniature sort of sub experiences that we have for each individual, which mean that then even after post event, either back in real life or even elsewhere on a discord or wherever we can still converse and talk about what did you see? Oh, did you get that thing? And it leans into this kind of, um, this other sort of theme that, that was sort of running through at South by with, uh, at some of the talks where people were saying there's this convergence between the digital and the physical and still the physical world is going to be very exciting to us as we sort of converge in these in these sort of non-linear storytelling environments so if we think about things like meow wolf and and the, the experiences there where you're you know physically in a and vir virtually somewhere and um sleep no more and, and these sort of uh theatrical immersive theater experiences there's that too and and people can have wonderful unique moments that are completely magical and unexpected because of the way things have been curated and set up and, and choreographed. Um, so it's this, it's this sort of part serendipity that feels exciting, um, as well as this sort of doing it with your friends and being completely autonomous. So yeah, I, does that resonate? I, <laughs> I love what you said about you can be the main character, which is so obvious in the video game world, of course, I'm the main character. Of course, I'm creating my own path and my own journey and my own value. And not to mention the flex of there are many different ways to solve a challenge. And I'm going to go about it in my particular way, which games do exceptionally well. But what if we, what if we brought that theme to what we do? You can be the main character in your learning journey. And, and, and this big shift from a consumer of learning experiences, which I think is sort of a default thinking of put something in front of someone to a creator, to a collaborator. And if I were to think of sort of, not that I'm very big on generational thinking, but if I were to think about what's been empowered in newer generations, certainly those with the tools and the access to tools and knowledge never had before, we'll touch on AI in a second, but it's there is a bias towards creation and collaboration because you have a tool set and you're ready to run with it. And I just, I wonder, you know, and this is an incredibly abstract conversation, but I'm more than happy to go down this road, but this, this idea of you can be the main character in your learning journey within your organization, and you can be from the default mode of being a creator of that journey and a collaborator of that journey, rather than just a consumer of that journey. One of the things I'm, I'm reflecting on as we're talking is that maybe the reason why younger people are able to do this is because they have more time. Like we have this slight conundrum that we're trying to balance learning with the job of the day and the work that we're doing. And so invariably it wouldn't be appropriate to suggest that, you know, wouldn't it be cool if everybody could spend three hours every day kind of being on a platform where they're, you know, but it's, but it's, um, but it's something, but it's something around uh, and, and platforms have tried this, you know, so in a way it's maybe what's the fresh thing, you know, I, I, for a long time platforms have been trying to say, well, you can become the, you can become the thought leader in your organization or people can come to you for stuff on this platform. And, uh, but sometimes I feel like those platforms don't end up building this sort of social ecosystem. They feel like a kind of, you know, tumbleweed environment where you're exactly right. You know, billboards of content go up. The only reason people go through them is because they've been assigned them and it's compliance and they have to do it. Or sometimes they're on a good, a good learning track and therefore, you know, it's, it's for career progression. But I love your, you know, switching the thinking from not you can be the, the kind of, um, the character, the main character in this course, but actually in your career. And so 
If you're the main character in your career development, here are some platforms that we can provide you that, you know, or that you can use to potentially connect with others, you know, make the most of it as you need to when you have the time to do it, to grow your potential, to increase your network, to develop um, skills that you're going to need for enhanced performance, you know, whatever it may be. I guess I'm thinking primarily of office work, but, you know, may, maybe I, lo- I love that distinction that you've drawn between not just the main character in the course, but, you know, in your career, but also acknowledging that we would need to find a sweet balance between the job of the day and the space where we're connecting to access or network. And, 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 and I think it's also, you're just kind of going with what's obvious. Of course, you're the, mo- the main character of your career development. Right. I think if you were to <laughs> ask, course, yeah. any, you know, I think if you were to ask anyone, they would do it. But that's, that's the tension I would say between an org well, you, view you of their that. people and, well, and, you, you and a person's s- own view of their career, you know? You, you say that, but don't you sometimes get the sense that there's a sort of, they owe me some training and development kind of mindset sometimes. There's, there's that too. And so perhaps it's, I owe me some training and development. <laughs> and then therefore, what well, tools and access do I have? Well, let's, let's, swi- let's switch this back into the, the Fortnite, Roblox world, any sort of open world game. If you were to bring that concept back to, I'm trying to accomplish a series of things defeat yep. the final boss, get the gold at the end of the rainbow, whatever that may be. There's an allowance, but ultimately an autonomy of, I know where I need to go to get the things I need to get on my pathway there. Right. And yes. I think that might be the balance of things versus you, you know, and I'm fully nerding out in the RPG world now. This is the difference between <laughs> main questing and side questing. You know, mm-hmm. this is like, of course, the, the environment's designed for you to converge towards the main quest at the end of the day. But it's it's the side questing. It's the friends we've made along the way that truly enrich our experience and give us the value to do it. And I think, and I want to touch on the other things you talked, you encountered at South By in a second, but to kind of put a bow on this, I would say the interesting characteristic of this uh generation for lack of a a better term coming into the workforce with a certain expectation is that they Mm -hmm. are used to having tools and environments that allow them to create meaning for themselves and that is an interesting characteristic to inherit as learning professionals who exist in a reality where things need to be put down a particular path and being told what you need to do. And so this idea of, I create my own meaning, I create my own value, I create my own career arc is a nice little... It's really nice. Feather in your cap of, so what are you going to do about it? Learning platforms, learning vendors like us, you know, what are you going to do about it for how we, uh, we approach that sort of freedom and responsibility of, don't give me the stuff, give me the environment. Mm, I love it. And I love this. I love, yeah, meaning creation that people have ownership over. That feels really important. Um, Okay. Well, you mentioned a minute ago that uh, Roblox looks kind of um, a little bit, what should we say? (laughs) We don't get it. Like even when I was speaking to the, um, to the girl from Roblox, we were, you know, we were, we were talking about it and she describes it as chaotic. And I said, yes, that's exactly how I feel when I look at it. It doesn't feel to me like, um, I can make any sense of this at all. And I come from a place where actually I, I do value the aesthetics and looks of things, not, not just the, not just the aesthetic and the look, but the whole experience and how it pulls us in. And As a tool, of course, we're using aesthetics and sound because they can better, you know, tell our story or connect to a topic in a more original or appropriate way. And when I was at South by, I was really lucky to see so many kind of beautiful examples of work, as I said, mainly in the XR space. But a lot of that's really informing my own visual vocabulary. And I think it's always really important for us to kind of grow that and be inspired by that. So here were a few kind of techniques. I'm not going to tell you too much about the experiences themselves, but sort of techniques that I noticed that just stood out and I could see potential application for. Um, Some of them aren't necessarily new, but some are, they've just been executed really beautifully. Um, So one of them was LIDAR scanning. And 
there were two pieces that really stood out. One was called Energea, which is a, an absolutely beautiful LIDAR scan of a nuclear energy plant. And you move through it at a kind of, uh, you know, the camera sort of moves through and you move through it at a slow pace. Music's really atmospheric. And you learn about um, and kind of experience experts talking about climate change and you sort of stumble across different perspectives. It's an incredibly ethereal experience because if you've seen LIDAR scans and, and, and sort of point clouds, they look very ghostly. They look like you're moving through kind of an X-ray, but they're highly accurate. So you're, you're getting a very clear sense of presence, but you're also feeling like you're not quite there. And so it just felt very uh, beautiful and curious. And it struck me that, you know, we quite often work with, I remember working with Tetra Pak and, and, and manufacturing, uh, you know, vaccine manufacturing um, partners and different clients where the physical location of their plant, manufacturing, whatever it may be, is incredibly important for people who don't usually go there to understand. And I just thought there could be something really lovely about showing this in a, in a different way. And there was another really lovely piece um, called Buried in the Rock. Again, um, using a LIDAR scan of some caves. It was from ScanLab. Um, directed by Shahani Fernando. And this was a, a story, a fairly fairly compact story about a cave um, climbing couple. And you start off outside and there's a sort of photogrammetry look and then you go inside the cave and it's all been scanned really accurately. And then they add in the, the kind of couple climbing down and it was just extremely effective, affective and effective. Very simply done, very clearly um, directed. And I thought that that was great for kind of explainer approaches and could be could be appropriate to certain certain use cases and sort of building on that technique photogrammetry so that's where you're taking um sort of volume well there's photogrammetry and and volumetric capture but photogrammetry was was used for a, a vr piece called the tent uh, sorry an ar piece called the tent which is a really interesting story of kind of place and home and uh, a tent arrives in somebody's garden and, and, you know, there's a voice inside and you have to kind of understand it. But the way that it's been done has been placed sort of very real, sort of semi-realistic. Well, they are realistic because they've been, they've been filmed, but, um, videos, video versions of the, of the people who are, um, the actors effectively. And then you can sort of place them in 3D space and you can do, do interesting things with that. So yeah, there's this sort of scanning, um, photo, photogrammetry, uh, volumetric capture vibe that's quite uh, prevalent in documentary based sort of storytelling and, and sort of moving into fictional storytelling that's being used in immersive spaces that I think is quite interesting, potentially with application for us if we're back to kind of content creation, <laughs> to the opposite point of what we were just saying earlier, but, you know, inspiring aesthetics. Well, I, I, I what what kind of took me down a path from what you mentioned there which all sounds incredibly exciting is this business requirement of and you hear this a lot of certain conversations i have with clients about having a sense of pride in our organization uh or for that new hire that new remote hire how do you make this person feel what this company is all about and to your point about you know in manufacturing there's pride in the plant in the in the workshop uh there's pride in the supply chain there's pride in, you know there's there's so many real world examples of oh if i could only take you there if i could you know if i you you'd have to see it to believe it you know if you really understood our commitment to sustainability and what we're doing about deforestation in this part of the world you know there's there's this component of storytelling to achieve certain business outcomes of belief that can really only be unlocked with a certain level of immersion right and so and then i'm I will always bring the balance of sort of my business lens of these things to the aesthetic uh, value of what we're trying to do as well too. There's a business case to be made of, I can't fly my 23,000 employees to see the wonder of X, but what I can do is create a reality or a place where you can navigate that uh, and uh, explore it for yourself coming back to this idea of autonomy 
explored for yourself in a way that I couldn't just do on a PowerPoint slide or a storyline slide that says, here's the story of, you know, uh, and, you know, let's, let's take this beyond space and even time, right? It is, here's the story of our founder and how they start off as an entrepreneur 50 years ago, selling one thing, and now they sell 50 things, you know, and all these things. There's this element of immersion meets realism to unlock uh, something emotive, that is really what a lot of organizations are trying to do at the end of the day, which is scale a certain type of experience that we know we're trying to unlock within our people to make them feel pride, belief, instilling values, commitment to our sustainability program. That can only be taken so far in our existing tools, and our existing toolkit to really bring out that emotive component that we're trying to unlock. Wow, you articulated that so much better than I could have. <laughs> but you're so you're it's so the coffee. Right. <laughs> no, no. I think one of the you, you talked about bringing to life the founder, and still one of my favorite projects. I must have done it twenty years ago. Was for Toyota when um, we started working on the origin of the Toyota story with Sakichi Toyota, who, and I and I, I remember all of it probably because it was one of my first projects. My memory was stronger back then. Um, <clears throat> But in order to create belief, and actually it speaks a little bit to this sort of autonomy agency discussion we were having before, we had been given this sort of footage that was sort of old fashioned and, and we leaned into that and took different parts of it and crafted an interactive story into that and set it up that you were the potential future founder of Toyota and you had a choice between your father who wants you to become a, I think, I think it was carpenter, um, I ought to remember that. And, um, or what you want to do, which is being an inventor and entering this competition that you want to reimagine the loom for your mother because you see her working so hard on this loom. This is late, late 1800s. And so you get to choose. And so if you chose, I follow in the footsteps of my father, it goes, oh, sorry, you never found the company in a sort of roundabout, you know, cul-de-sac way that we do these interactive stories. Or, um, and then of course, if you choose to do the loom and take the risk and, and, and be the inventor. And <clears throat> the, the way that we told the story was simple with the tools that we had at the time, but the concept of, of augmenting and layering in historic footage with present day footage and, and, and sort of knitted together in a, in a sort of choose your own adventure type story was also at South by. So I saw there's a really lovely piece called Walk to Westerbrook, which is the story of a Dutch Jewish Holocaust survivor and they layered in this historic footage in, into sort of 360 environments into sort of present day footage. And again, it's quite effective. You can add a sense of magic because you can put dust motes in and you, you know, people can, we can all understand that here we are today in the virtual present and that there were the footsteps of our forebears and, you know, in this city. And haven't we always wondered, you know, what did this place look like a hundred years ago? Or, you know, particularly if you're working with a brand that has got that, that length of history. Um, and, and the sense that you, you want all people to feel a sense of pride and belief and, uh, recognition and understanding of that collective history that you all share, even if you've joined the company 60 years after it was founded. Those techniques sort of visually do help to bring, bring that to life. So, um, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned, I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, it's, it's, it's a great example of something that we're always trying to solve for whether on the vendor side or the organization side of this idea of there, if you believe in, you know, the transformative power of storytelling starting point there, uh, and if you don't, you probably should turn off at this stage, but anyway, uh, but if you believe in that, then you know that there are some stories that you can get away with being told at you and some stories that you can only really truly unlock by having you being to bring it all together where you're the main character in that story. And whenever I think about hearing stories and, you know, from all the conversations I have with clients about like, oh, I just wish our people knew the great stuff that we're doing, you know, and it's all right there. I mean, if they only knew in R and D or what our scientists are up to, it's just, you know, there's so much going on there. I just, if only our people knew, if only our people knew all of these things, or even the point of like, I, you know, uh, or to to take the the negative of that, oh well, you know, 
we used to be so into our values and now we've kind of gone away from them and now we're renewing our values. If people only knew what this company used to stand for, you know, that there's just, I, I immediately gravitate towards this can be solved with the right story. And you can swap story out for knowledge gaps, skill gaps, behavioral gaps, if you feel more comfortable doing that. But the output for me, the format for me is feeling versus knowledge. And sometimes we err too much on the side of knowledge when sometimes, and you know, let's be honest, most of our decision-making is irrational anyway. If we swing more towards the emotion of what informs who we are and what we do in the workplace, there might be more space for us to develop something than if we were just to be overly rational, which sometimes I think we can be guilty of uh, in the learning space of, well, there's nothing that we can't solve with a good old fashioned filling of a knowledge gap, you know, like. Yeah, yeah, they must need to know it. That's what's why they're not doing it, that kind of old yeah. mindset, yeah. No, I love, I love that. And there was one final other uh, technique that I'm, I'm only going to mention it briefly just because um, it probably has less utility and potentially less access for us as creators because we don't tend to have these tools. But um, there were some really lovely pieces. One springs to mind. It was called Young Thang and it was directed by Melissa Joyner. And it's a VR piece that retells the story of a, a, um, a, a Nigerian folklore. And it was done <clears throat> in, a, in a 3D tool um, called Quill, which may, people may know, and um, also Tilt Brush. I saw another piece uh, called Soul Paint that was uh, developed using Tilt Brush. And these are, these t sort of to your point about creator tools, in a way, anybody who has a headset can get uh, Tilt Brush or Open Brush and can start drawing in 3D space. And if you've done that before, or even if you haven't, when you do that, something incredible starts to happen when you try and create a shape that you can walk around the back of it's kind of mind-blowing you know we don't usually use space in that way we're normally constructing things that sit on a flat page or maybe they have a shadow and so we're creating a bit of depth but when you can physically move around the things that you create it's a totally different experience and one of the things that that achieves is in in the in the case of the um the quill example um, is this high vibrance and this really kind of uh, bold aesthetic that just draws you in, it really pulls you in. And especially when you start to become now surrounded by the things that have either you've created or have been created around you, this enveloping feeling is uh, something that I just, I think you can do it in 2D, but using depth inside a web you know, like a WebGL, you know, that we, you, you could totally create a sense of depth. And there can be something quite, f in, a, in a good way, flooding and kind of overwhelming, <laughs> in a positive way, <laughs> joyous, exciting, you know, um, affective, peaking, that you can get from, from fairly simple um, tools. Now, I'm not going to say that to do it well is easy, because for sure it isn't. And this one was a really good example of one that was done very well. But uh, I think even learning to play spatially, all of us should be doing that because we're moving towards this more spatial web. We're going to need to find new, we, we're going to be influenced by 3D and immersive worlds and culture that are going to start percolating their way into our worlds. And so to become familiar with them through easily accessible tools could be could be quite helpful rather than feeling like, oh, it's all something I need to do in Unity and I can't do it and it's Unreal Engine and it's too complicated. Actually, there is this sort of potentially quite exciting and inviting aesthetic that we could get, get you know, access quite quickly um, through these things like Quill and Tilt Brush. So yeah, that was, um, that was just something else to, to throw into the mix. You, you know, when we think about what kind of emotions do we want to generate? It, it, for me, it kind of, was a broader message of the reality of where organizations are at with their tools, their existing tools. And there's always that first sort of barrier of conversation of, have you cleared this with IT? What does this mean? All of those things. And so this, and rightfully so, there's always this bias towards use the things that we have and not necessarily uh, think beyond the canvas, but the way that you framed that was just a great example for me of where we're going 
with the access to tools that we have and will continue to have. And if I sort of think of one of the ways AI is going to accelerate these things, tying it to the new generation of creators, I will say, is that uh, we have never lived in more exciting times of creation. And the organizations that embrace creation rather than uh, curb it are the ones that will succeed. And so whether it is about uh, trying out uh, Quill uh, and, and, and creating an environment that's like, hey, the spatial realm is something we didn't really think about as a learning landscape, you know, uh, or whether it is the organization that is, you know, finally trying to break up with this LMS and finding a new way to figure out the best way to, uh, you know, administrate or organize uh, their people and what happens in the learning culture within it. There's this element of creation versus consumption that is exciting for me. Uh, and through, and I would sort of as a red thread through all the things that we spoke about today as just how do we embrace and empower more creation? Uh, because the possibilities of what you learn and what it means, and we can still have that main quest. Don't worry about that. The main quest will always exist, but the possibilities that get unlocked almost from, and I, uh, Something I say all the time is you'd be amazed what happens if you give the keys of learning to your people and and not think too much and not feel like you have to prescribe every step and every moment of their time and energy to do it. That to me is almost, you know, in a highly provocative setting, what if you just gave your people a goal and gave them tools and that was it, you know? Now, yeah. Of, yeah. of course, we're or not in the video game. you augmented them with some tools so that they didn't have to yeah. worry too much about it. But do you, do you remember when the RSA was doing um, those recordings of, of podcasts or interviews and then they just had the drawing kind of done alongside? It was it was like a whole movement like a long time ago. But it was it was a it was a it was a kind of a good example of what you could easily do, which is record something, you know, with one with an employee talking about something and then it's almost the creature comforts. I, I don't know if that reference is going to work for someone in North America, but, you know, with original, authentic voiceover recordings of natural chat and discussion kind of augmented with a artistic interpretation that, that may, in the case of creature comforts, parodies, but you don't have to do that. You know, you could do it another way. And, and to your point about creation, maybe there's a way that actually has, as sort of studios effectively, if this is our role potentially, we're sort of, we're running alongside in parallel people who are expert and taking an artistic twist on it to elevate it and give it greater kind of access and appeal and, you know, uh, reach. And that could be quite a cool co-creation process for all of us um, instead of this kind of content creation, deliver it old model. And just one, two more things I want to touch on. One is, I think what South by has told me is that we are heading towards a fundamental paradigm shift in terms of all kinds of storytelling. Things are going to be non-linear. Things are going to be immersive. We cannot escape that future reality. And so we need to start embracing it now and really thinking about what can we borrow? What can we take? How can we inform ourselves before it's too late and we just become irrelevant? Well, one of the things I always think we're fortunate about in L&D is that we have the privilege of being the last mover, not the first so mover, slow. the last mover, <laughs> because we get to yeah. we get to steal with pride from everything. We've been stealing from marketing for yes. ages. We've been yeah. stealing from cinema, from music, yeah. for a, a, lo a lot of different things. Um, and we so should be I'm, really good at it then, shouldn't we? Yeah, we, <laughs> we so should be really good at shoulders it. Shoulders of giants to stand on. Exactly. But uh, I, I think rightfully said in the sense of even if you know put immersion to the side even the idea of non-linear open-ended experiences uh would be such a jolt to uh your team and your organization and such a breath of fresh air coming back to kind of reviving employee experiences like oh wait i have options now 
oh wait, I can move in this direction. And I and when I mean options, I don't necessarily mean, oh, I can move from this piece of content to this piece of content. Right. But really this right. idea of the reward, the reward of more content. Yeah. Ah, there isn't like choice. Oh, <laughs> Doesn't you feel know, like you, the right You were reward frustrated with five thousand assets. Well now you have ten thousand assets to yeah. navigate. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so and maybe this 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 can be something that we can end on because I know you have uh some reflections as well too from what you saw on AI in South by as well too. But mm -hmm. this for me is a realm of creation meets access to a certain degree of how we could use AI to create that hyper individualization, that unique experience, that autonomy that perhaps the current model or thinking of that's dominating our default thinking in the in the space can challenge in a in a great way. Yeah, wholly. Um, it, that is, <laughs> let's t let's step into that AI then, shall we? Because you're right, mm -hmm. AI is going to be able to transform and individualize everything. Um, I feel like your what I saw at South by was every single talk, every single track, every single industry, AI, 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 and of course, <clears throat> it's almost it's almost so big that there's this kind of combined urgency and sort of stupefaction that no one quite knows how to act, but everyone knows we're all in this big race. And um, I think the, the talks that I went to, and of course there are so many more and there's so much more to learn, always grounded me in this. And I'll share just sort of a, <clears throat> maybe it's just a, a cultural understanding that I think is gonna be important. Yes, it was everywhere. Yes, I got the sense quite clearly that it's going to be the next seismic shift in everything, living, working, and really importantly, kind of how we attribute value to human life. And I think that that was something that came out quite uh, a little bit more clearly for me in some of these talks. But one of the people who helped frame this really well was Amy Webb. She talked about the 2024 tech trends report. You can see this talk on South by Southwest uh, YouTube channel. She talked about us, she described us as the transition generation, Gen T. We're all going to be affected by this shift. I th and I just thought that that's already, that's such a helpful framing to know we're all in it together and we're in this, we're in the same boat and it's going to be big. And so get ready, buckle up. If you buckle up in a boat, mixing my metaphors. Um, but she talked about this idea that this, this sort of advent of AI, and we, you know, we've been sailing into it for, for the last couple of years, but it marks a tech super cycle. <clears throat> and what she said was it kind of, it's distinct and set apart from previous um, uh, disruptions, tech disruptions from the past, like the steam engine in the industrial revolution or the internet in the tech revolution, because it's a, it's a convergence of multiple technologies, which means we're gonna find acceleration all at once. And so it's going to be all encompassing, underpinning and everywhere. And then she moved on to talking about things like face supremacy and sensors. So uh, the reason I mentioned that is because we've been leaning at the moment on large language models to do things, you know, to kind of use text prompts for, for visuals and for, for, for copy. But what we're moving towards is large action models that will predict what we're going to do. And so kind of linking it back to um, why I mentioned sensors and face supremacy, the idea of the Apple Vision Pro, which is one of the big kind of releases in the immersive world in recent weeks um, or recent months is the sensors actually that are all that are on it are providing data about how we move through the world what we look at how our pupils dilate before we've even consciously made a decision about something and so ultimately these tools can potentially be learning how we are going to act and um, we don't know where that data is going. We don't know how it's going to be used, but one thought could be that it is going to become something that informs these large action models that has this sort of behavioral uh, prediction capability, which I think from our perspective is hugely uh, fertile territory to grasp, but also just kind of, you know, it's, it's fascinating for us to think about. And then Ray Kurzweil, who's, who you'll know from the singularity Who's, he's just actually written a book called The Singularity is Nearer, and it's coming out, I think, in the summer. Um, That's he good said to hear. something. Yeah, I, I know. I know. Well, yeah, 2029 <laughs> is an important year and 2045. So we're, we're seeing some big things coming soon. If we hadn't uh, already thought that we were 
the end was night. No, we can't say that. Um, he just dropped kind of casually into, into his talk, something that really floored me. And he said, soon talent won't be important because everyone can access knowledge. And I just thought, wait, you're right. That, I mean, maybe we all knew that instinctively in this kind of AI is going to take our jobs sort of vibe. But actually to articulate it that way was really interesting to me because it, talk, it speaks to how we assign value to human life. So if I can access the knowledge of my superiors, do we get paid the same? Do we get paid nothing now? Because we're all, you know, our, our whole kind of economic means of survival is called into question if our human capital's phased away. And straight away, I went to the pub quiz because I was like, hang on a minute, that is going to ruin what used to be a good night out where you could have oh teams gosh, right. guessing yeah. what was going to happen. And then I thought, maybe we'll have like kill switch nights where in the future we all decide to go out and we switch off our AI <laughs> knowledge components, partners, whatever they are, implants, and our augmented intelligence is down and we end, attempt to play like Trivial Pursuit and we're just like terribly bad at it or maybe we try and do a pub quiz. And that's the subversive in me. But, you know, these are really important questions. What is talent going to look like in the future? How how do we even start to cope with that? And um, and the fact that this is pervasive, you know, how do we all, how do we all, uh, as Generation T, Gen T, navigate this space together? And so I didn't really come away with any clear answers. I think there are better people than me in our space that are really looking at the pragmatics of AI in, in e-learning and digital learning in, in our space. And that's really important work. But this was a sort of bigger zoom out that I took from, from these two talks, which I just thought I would throw in here because that's what South by gave me. <laughs> um, I mean, first of all, thanks for confirming for me that Minority Remort Report remains the most accurate science fiction movie of all time, uh, because it seems oh. we are definitely moving in that direction. <laughs> but what you'll notice about the Apple Vision Pro is that we don't do this. We could just do it from our laps. So the the, the choreography is a little bit different, but you're right. Okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> something in that. I'm, I'm sure that was mostly a Tom Cruise special because he's uh, right. fantastic with his hands. Uh, but, you know, it it it. I guess it, it, for me, it stings on something that's always been on my mind in the last year or so is that if AI is taking care of knowledge, where does that leave L and D? Maybe that's just a great question to end on, uh, as it's, uh, it's certainly something that we can pick up on uh, next time, but it is something that we directly will need to face, uh, much sooner than we think, I would say. I agree. Ray Kurzweil would say that we have our interests that are going to set us apart, but I'm not sure that, you know, developing an interest in stamp collecting is going to set me apart enough that it will be interesting enough for us to survive. So I think that's a great question. I agree. Well, well, it sounds like uh, South by was a fantastic experience. I've never been, and now you've been, you've convinced me to get there next time because uh, there's so much to take away. And also just thanks a lot in general for just the constant connections that we can bring to what we do every day and the inspiration that it brings, because it certainly inspired me uh, in very provocative ways. One being, I'm going to go uh, hang out with my niece again and, and peek over her before she yells at me about her Roblox to learn more. But uh, the idea of consumption to creation to collaboration is something I'm certainly taking away from our conversation today. Fantastic. It's been so nice talking to you. And I love how you've managed to synthesize all of that down into that wonderful summary. So I will say no more and I will speak to you soon. Speak to you soon. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Josh. Bye. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to stay up to date with leading lights from L&D and leave us a review to let us know what you think.